And for you to send to me, there's never been a greater time out of the GDP markdown by Goldman Sachs on China, the mystery of oil demand to me right now off the chart. Do you have a clue what oil demand is going to be this year? Yeah, we think it is going to continue to rise and uh, rise by about close to 3 million barrels per day. It's not going to be quite there, but yeah, close to that. China actually isn't going to be the biggest driver of growth uh, because, you know, you've obviously still got zero COVID policy there. We don't necessarily think they're going to lift that anytime soon, but it is going to be the rest of Asia. Most of Asia hasn't actually had uh, much of a summer driving season as we've seen in the West. Uh, last year, a lot of parts of Asia were still in lockdown or at least under some form of mobility restrictions so you're going to see you are already seeing a lot of strong demand growth numbers coming out of there of course now cases are rising everywhere in in the east uh, but once we are through this period uh, the summer should be very very strong Amrita what do you make of this Francisco Blanche of Bank of America call for a hundred dollars or plus uh, oil prices by the second quarter I mean, our price forecast, which has been like, you know, consistent for a few years now, uh, we've been calling for $114 for next year. That's an annual average. So of course, it goes well above 120 next year. We don't necessarily see that this year, even though we are saying and our, our models are showing that that uh, inventories globally are uh, not just at a record le low levels um, this summer. They're going to fall down to those levels. Uh, but they are going to be at levels we've really never seen, especially uh, on a global basis, uh, but especially in, in uh, non-OECD countries. So yes, there are risks that prices go higher. I mean, our annual average for this year is 85. But the worry, of course, in the near term still is COVID. Demand is still hamstrung. OPEC still has barrels to give. So for us, the real spike in oil price story remains second half, like really end of this year into next year. The caveat to that is these supply outages. We've seen so many of them, Ecuador, Libya, Nigeria, Kazakhstan recently. If these keep mounting, of of course, you can get to hundred dollars earlier, but without those, it'll still be end of the year into next year. How much are we underestimating the higher cost to actually refine some of the oil that's going to be coming online, especially in light of some of the other material inflation that we've seen around the world? It's a great question and, you know, something we've been accounting for in our uh, balances, uh, to, to Tom's point, in terms of the economics of it, it becomes very important. We are looking at cost inflation of at least 10 to 15 percent across the upstream industry. And that just means that, again, you need a higher price just for these producers to break even because they need that much more in, in terms of uh, their equipment uh, and just for sustaining their production. So that's a minimum, 10 to 15 percent. In some areas we're hearing about 20% inflation uh, when it comes to oil services. And Rita, just finally, how strong is our understanding of the relationship between, say, balance sheet reduction and crude prices, interest rate hikes and crude prices? The latter we have a ton of experience with, the former not so much. Oh, absolutely. And I think this is going to be, again, if you talk about wild cards or, you know, just uh, events outside of the core fundamentals of oil impacting uh, crude this year, it's going to be hugely important. Um, generally speaking, if we do enter a period of tightening monetary policy um, or even fiscal policy for that matter, we are going to be in a period of lower growth and by definition lower oil prices. But if you that is accompanied with inflation, <coughs> oil tends to do perform very well in a high inflationary period. So that's your juxtaposition with that theory.